Tell her everybody. Welcome to our service. Those online, we thank you that you can join us. Thank you, praise team. You have blessed me tremendously. And musicians, we always appreciate you. Do you know I'm smiling like this? Because pastor is never here when I have to do a sermon. And you know, lo and behold, he is up front and center with a big smile on his face. God, <laughs> you, could <laughs> you wouldn't leave. God bless you, Pastor Anderson. We thank you for your leadership. I'll be speaking today on do as I say. And it will be based on the first, first Kings chapter 13. And that story said it in a nutshell. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are awesome. You are worthy of our praise. You are long-suffering and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit with us today. We ask that you take full control of this moment. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. First Kings chapter 13, that's the full chapter, but I'm going to... You have to fully understand this chapter, so I'll give you a backstory. As Pastor Anderson always said, context is everything. It's important. So at the end of First Kings 11, Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam becomes king. However... Earlier in that same chapter, it is prophesied that the kingdom will be split. And 10 of the 12 tribes would form a separate kingdom under the reign of a man named Jeroboam, who was one of Solomon's administrators, but not related to King David. The northern 10 tribes call themselves Israel which will be ruled by Jeroboam. And the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, called themselves Judah, will be ruled by Rehoboam. Now, Jeroboam knew that the people would still want to travel to Jerusalem to worship God as prescribed in the law. And this made him afraid. So you will find in 1 Kings 12, 27 to 31, he said, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even to Dan. And he made an house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 38, God said to Jeroboam, through the prophet Ahijah, he said, if you do whatever I command you and walk in obedience to me and do what is right in my eyes by obeying my decrees and commands, as David my servant did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and I will give Israel to you. That's what God promised for Jeroboam. So despite the fact that he received his kingdom and authority by God, 
he did not believe God. Jeroboam takes matters into his own hands and decided to completely ignore the law and create his own religion and form of worship. This is reinforced in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 33, when the text emphasizes that the date Jeroboam picks to start his religious festival is merely one of his own choosing, in contrast to the specific calendar of feast and worship given by God in the law. He makes idols, set up his own altar in Bethel, names himself and other people as priests, and prepares to consecrate his imitation holy places by burning incense. Now, the persons who alone were allowed to offer at the altars were the priests descended from Levites, but these were in Jerusalem. Now, the name of that city was Bethel. And if you recall how that name came about, when Jacob deceived his brother Esau and stole his birthright, he had to run for his life. And as he was running to Haram, as his mother bid him to, one night he lay down to sleep and he dreamt a dream. He dreamt that the ladder was reaching from earth to heaven and angels were ascending and descending. And God was speaking to him from the top of the ladder. And he told Jacob, I will bring you back to this place. I will be with you in your travels. I will bring you back over this place. And I will give you that land, that said place where he was sleeping. God said he will give them. So when Jacob awoke, he said, this is the house of God and the gate of heaven. And I did not know it. So he placed the stone that he had for his pillow. He made a pillar of it and poured oil on it and said, if the Lord brought me back, I will surely serve him all my life. So he called that place Bethel, means house of God. So you would expect that God would be honored there. Sadly, that was not the case. Bethel had become a place of corruption and a place of convenience. Jeroboam the king had set up an alternate place of worship that would be more convenient. It was his plan to control the people and keep them loyal. However, God is not, he would not allow Jeroboam to so openly make a mockery of the sacrificial system through leading the people into such blatant disobedience and idolatry. So he sends a prophet from Judah and in chapter 13, he will be referred to as the man of God. He sent him to warn him. So we now move forward to our story in chapter 13. Verse 1. Now behold, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, while Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and the human bones shall be burned on you. Then he gave a sign the same day, saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes which are on it shall be poured out. Notice, the man of God spoke to the altar, not to the king, as though God no longer wanted to address Jeroboam, a man so filled with himself and his plans that he had no time to listen to God. The message declared that the future lay with the house of David, not with the house of Jeroboam, even though God had promised him that, but he was disobedient. Verse 4, now it came about when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar in Bethel, 
that Jeroboam stretched out, stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him! But his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. Can you imagine? You point your finger at the servant of God, and your hands stuck out, can't come back. You go to sleep, your hand is up. You try to drive your car, you can't even drive a car now. You try to take a shower, you can't do that. It's a dangerous thing when you are given advice from the man of God and you are rebellious. You never know what God can do because the actions of God, not the actions of Jeroboam, determine the outcome. God would fulfill his word despite any resistance or opposition. Verse 5. The altar also was split apart, and the ashes were poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Because you see, according to the Mosaic law, the priests were to carefully carry away the ashes from the altar to a clean place for disposal. The pouring out of them there, along with the destruction of the altar, symbolized God's control of Jeroboam and his rejection of the sacrificial system. A torn altar signified torn religion, a religion under judgment. Verse 6. The king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the Lord your God. Hold a minute. Please entreat the Lord your God. So which means, it was the king, you got the message right there. And pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and it became as it was before. So an infuriated Jeroboam then sought that the intruder be arrested. But to his horror, on stretching out his hand, it became withered. He also discovered that he could not draw it back again. He realized that he had reached out his hand against the servant of God and had been smitten. Now, Jeroboam looked for help. But he didn't look for help from the calves of gold that he made. He looked for help from God, from his power and his favor. But Jeroboam does not desire the prophet to pray that his sins might be pardoned and his heart changed, but only that his hand be restored. He seemed affected for the present with both judgment and the mercy, but that impression soon wore off. But it should have been obvious to all around that the Lord was not Jeroboam's God. So the people should understand that they've been deceived. But to his credit, the man of God showed great mercy to Jeroboam. He quickly moved from being under arrest to being an intercessor for the prosecutor. This was great mercy from the man of God and especially from God who answered his prayer. By being merciful, God wanted Jeroboam to repent. But did he? Let's move on. Verse 7. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. Now, no doubt, very shaken and relieved, the king now called on the man of God to come home with him and refresh himself after which he would give him a reward. He was hoping that if the man of God ate with him, he would be able to know that he was no longer seen as God's enemy and that he was forgiven. You see, the laws of hospitality at that time were of such that to eat with someone would declare goodwill towards them and indicate no evil intentions against them. 
and this would equally apply in the case of an official representative. Thus, he was seeking to curry the man of God's favor and the favor of God himself. Let's move on, verse 8. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall eat no bread, nor drink water, nor return by the way which you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way which he came to Bethel. Now, the prohibition not to eat or drink in Bethel was because all the people had apostatized. And the reason he was not allowed to return the same way was lest he should be recognized by any whom he had seen in going. But you know, I think, the, well, in reading this, maybe the man of God talked too much. Because he should not have made known that he had to go another way. He is to go directly to Bethel and come directly back. He is not even to stop for refreshment. And he is to vary his route so that he cannot easily be found and prevented from completing his mission. But it is when he stopped that then his troubles began. Verse 11. Now an old prophet was living in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the deeds which the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken to the king, these also they related to their father. Their father said to them, which way did he go? Now his sons had seen the way which the man of God who came from Judah had gone. Then he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode away on it. So he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. He said, I cannot return with you, nor go with you, nor will I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For a command came to me by the word of the Lord. You shall eat no bread, nor drink water there. Do not return by going the way which you came. He talked too much. <laughs> he said to him, I also am a prophet like you. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. You see, unfortunately, the man of God took his words as genuine and returned to his house to eat and drink with him. He should not, of course, have done so without himself receiving a word from God. But one problem with being an honest man was that he assumed that others, especially prophets of the Lord, were also honest men. He would probably not have considered the possibility that he was being tested out. After all, had not God's miraculous working confirmed his genuineness? After all, the altar split, the man hand was restored. But the old prophet, meanwhile, was probably congratulating himself on the success of his attempt to prove that the man was an imposter. Otherwise, why would he have gone against the word that he had received from God? Verse 20. Now it came about, as they were sitting down at the table, that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the command of the Lord and have not observed the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but have returned and eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your body shall not come to the grave of your fathers. 
The tragedy is that it was too late for the man from Judah to change his mind because the word of the Lord truly came to the old prophet while they were eating. You see, God could use anybody to give his message. Even though the old prophet lied, he had to send a message to that young prophet. He had to acknowledge to himself that he had seemingly betrayed a true prophet of God. But however embarrassed he might have felt, because it was the word of the Lord for the man of God, he could not hold it back. And he declared to the man of God that because he had disobeyed the Lord, he would not die in peace, which means he would not be laid in the tomb of his fathers, what, which was a kind of bad thing for those people. They want to be buried where the fathers were buried. But no other detail was given. Let's move on, verse 23. It came about after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk. Are you telling me that after that, that prophecy was given to him, he still continued to eat and drink? It seems as though, okay, well, since that, all, that was already set in my mind as well, finish my meal. It came about after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled the donkey for him, for the prophet whom he had brought back. Now when he had gone, a lion met him on the way and killed him, and his body was thrown on, on the road with the donkey standing beside it. The lion also was standing beside the donkey. Both the donkey and the lion acted unnaturally. Imagine the donkey did not run and the lion did not attack the donkey or disturb the man's body. You see, that lion was on a mission from God. He did not come there to destroy the donkey. He was on a mission and he did that and just sat down and waited. Unlike the disobedient prophet, the beast bent their wills to God's sovereignty. Verse 25. And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown on the road and the lion standing beside the body. So they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. Now when the prophet who brought him back from the way heard it, he said, it is the man of God who disobeyed the command of the Lord. Therefore the lion, the Lord has given him to the lion, which was which has torn him and killed him. He couldn't say torn him and killed him. He just assuming, he did not see it as yet. He just assumed the lion may be torn him. The lion just killed him. According to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. Then he spoke to his son saying, saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled it. He went and found his body thrown on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body, nor torn the donkey. So the prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back. And he came to the city of the old prophet to mourn and to bury him. He laid his body in his own grave and they mourned over him saying, Alas, my brother. After he had buried him, he spoke to his sons saying, When I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones, for the thing shall surely come to pass, which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria. One more. Now, there are two key passages. There are two key messages, sorry, that are given to Israel and to us as we learn from these events. First, we must believe the word of the Lord regardless of what other people say. The man of God was deceived by the old prophet. It is the old prophet's fault that, he, that this happened to him. The lion should go eat the old prophet for what he did. Not the man of God who has been deceived. Certainly, 
the old prophet sinned for what he did and would be held in account for it. But that is not the point of the text. The point of this event is to show us we bear the responsibility to know what is the word of the Lord and to carefully follow the word of the Lord. We cannot make the excuse that we were deceived by a teacher or a preacher. We cannot make the excuse that we were deceived by the church. If we lived during the time we would during that time, we would not even be able to make the excuse that we were deceived by a false prophet. You got mauled by a lion. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul said? In first in Galatians 1 6 to 9, he said, He did not care if an apostle or an angel from heaven should preach something to you if it is contrary to the revealed gospel. We are to reject it and understand that the one who spoke it is accursed. The man of God received his first instruction directly from God. Since God was the one who gave him the first instructions, the prophet should have waited for God to give him any further instructions. If the plan was going to change, God would be the one to do it. Even though what this other prophet said sounded legit, it wasn't. Plus, you don't forsake God's instructions for your own comforts. The prophet was told not to eat or drink in that town. But when they found him sitting under the tree, he was probably tired, hungry, and thirsty. He should not have been sitting, he should have been continuing walking. I'm sure the invitation was tempting, though he rejected it at first with the declaration of this so-called fellow prophet. He was won over. Now, did he not think it necessary to first inquire of the Lord, or did he choose not to because of how hungry he was? When Jesus was hungry in the desert, Satan tried to get him to use his power to make bread. I'm sure he was tempted to do what the deceiver suggested. But instead, Jesus responded by superseding his physical need with a spiritual one saying, and I'm sure you know it, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded. That's right. The prophet should have responded likewise. He superseded the word from the mouth of God with the word from the mouth of man along with his physical needs. We don't know the old prophet's motivation. Obviously, he had no regard for the word of God because after the, the man of God told him what God said, if he was truly a man of God, he would have said, okay, okay. But he didn't. Maybe he deliberately planned the lie on the way to catch up with the man of God. Or maybe it just slipped out as a little white lie. Whatever the reason, this man of God, who so far had been doing God's will, believed the old prophet and went home with him. We need to take this to heart. First of all, don't ever say God said or the Holy Spirit told me unless you are totally sure. We can be tricked into thinking God is speaking to us when he isn't. The prophet wanted food and water and he was tricked into thinking God was speaking through this man. You see, when we want something badly enough, we can convince ourselves God is giving his approval when he isn't. And it doesn't go well when we make decisions based on these deceptions. And we need to be careful when people are speaking to us. Sometimes people attach thus saith the Lord to their words when they didn't come from God. What people say can sound good, 
but it doesn't mean they're speaking from God. We have to be careful when someone says that God sent them or that they have a word from God for you. It's possible. But I think if God sent someone to tell me something, he would also tell me himself. Oftentimes, when God sends someone else, it's a confirmation more than a declaration. If I'm not listening to God, he may send someone to confirm what he's been trying to say to me. In any event, we need to test the spirits. First John 4 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. We have a responsibility to be cautious. We need to hold what people say up to the word. If it seems to pass that test, we pray for God to confirm or deny it. We can't blindly accept everything someone says is from God. If we fail to test the spirits, there can be serious consequences. We might not get mauled by a lion, but it won't turn out well. If we don't take time to seek God's wisdom in these matters and obey his clear instruction. We are responsible for learning the word of God for ourselves and holding on to that word regardless of what anyone else says. You should never ever believe anything I say simply because I say it. You should only believe what I say because you read, you read it in God's word. God's word is our only authority. It is so sad that there are so many who deceive whether innocently or intentionally with the word of God. Who cares what I say or anyone else says? We care about what God says and we learn what he says in his word. This also means that the scriptures cannot be twisted or rejected for experiences, opinions, or feelings. We cannot be upset with some sins and not others. We have a fine way of proclaiming from the rooftops the horror of the sins that we do not commit, but we often are not interested in proclaiming the sins we want to overlook with the same fervor. We look for a way around God's laws because of our own experiences. How often will someone make a life decision that clearly violates God's will, but will validate it because they found some preacher or teacher who agrees with that person? That is not how we define God's will. It does not matter what other people teach. God is the only authority. Just because you can find someone to agree with you does not make you right. Only the word of God determines if we are right or wrong. We can line up all kinds of false teachers and even have the majority with us and still be wrong. Jesus told us that it's a wide path that leads to destruction, and many find it. There is no consolation for having a bunch of people agree with you, like the man of God who was deceived by the old prophet. We might be deceived by what other people are telling us. Now, the old prophet mourns the man of God's death and buries the man in the old prophet's own grave. He then gave orders to his sons that the old prophet is to be buried in the same grave with his bones beside the bones of the man of God. His reasoning is that, as we read in 1 Kings 13.32, for the things shall surely come to pass which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria. This is almost assuredly confirmed 
by the conclusion of the chapter, which notes that Jeroboam does not repent of his sins, despite the incredible events that have occurred and continues to lead Israel down the path of idolatry. While this could be read as the old prophet repenting of his ways and recognizing the, the righteousness of God, it seems that is too generous a reading for this old prophet. It must be remembered that he lied about having an oracle from God which directly led to the death of the other prophet. He wanted to share a meal with the man of God, which is the exact same thing that Jeroboam was doing. If the king was attempting to bribe the man of God to spare Bethel, it seems likely that the prophet of Bethel was attempting to do the same thing. When his hospitality fails to change the will of God, then it seems that the old prophet takes further steps to protect himself. The man of God has prophesied that the bones of Bethel's priest will be burned on the altar. And the old prophet is well aware of the implications that statement has for his own bones because he will also be burned on the altar. He did not want that. So to spare his corpse, the indignity of this defilement, he is buried with a Judean prophet in hopes that his bones will be left untouched. Well, it seemed as if the old prophet was correct in his estimation because when King Josiah comes to Bethel and destroys the temple and the altar there, he indeed starts to dig up the bones from the graves and burns them on the altar. The only grave left, undisturbed, is that of the old prophet and the man of God. You can read it in 2 Kings 23. You see, God wants people who are humble so that they bow at God's word. They do not rewrite God's word. They do not ignore God's word. They allow God's word to change them. God's word is do as I say. We have heard the word of the Lord. We have had intercession made on our behalf. We have experienced the mercy and the grace of God. Yet we are tempted to continue doing what we are doing and not change from our evil ways. We continue to listen to our desires and our feelings rather than what the word of the Lord says to us. I'm almost done. The scriptures have presented two pictures so far. First, Israel wants worship to be convenient. Second, Israel will not listen when God has spoken. We cannot take the grace of God and reject what God has told us to do. When God has spoken, we must listen. We must approach God's word with humility and submission. We must approach the word of God trembling at what it says because it truly is the very words of God. God's grace is to cause that submissive heart in us. Otherwise, we are no different than Jeroboam, taking God's grace and rejecting it. The man of God did some of what God told him to do, but he didn't do all of it. Partial obedience is still disobedience. Sometimes we think if we, we've obeyed part of what God says, then that counts as obedience. But that's not what God says. Partial obedience is still disobedience in God's eyes. What this story is saying to us is that we should pay attention to what God says. We are to seek his will and not listen to the words of man. We are to pray for God's leadership in our times of joy and times of trial. 
We are to search the Bible for God's word and listen for his instructions. We are to follow those instructions before it is too late. We have the responsibility of following God. So many say God is love, and that is true. But we must realize that because he is love, we are to do his will. We are to love him and trust him with our very lives. We are to follow his instructions for godly living because it is his will. We cannot rely on man. Man will fail you. Man will lie to you. Man will deceive you. But we can trust God. Our very lives depend on it. Have you placed your trust in God today? Are you willing to drop what man says about the way you should live and trust God's word? Do you want to reach that point in your life when you can trust only in God? Are you willing, as the song says, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way? I'll say, yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart, not part, with my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Are you willing to do what God says? truth to 
too late to change things. Can you please stand with me? If only that man of God had turned around and left before he sat down at the table and took that first bite of food, things would have been different. Sometimes we do the same thing. We say words that hurt and then it is too late to take them back. We make promises and break them and it's too late to make things better. We put off making things right with other people and then it's too late. So many too late slip into people's lives and there is no way to change things. We wait and wait and wait to accept Christ as our Savior and then one day the Spirit stops pleading and it's too late. I want to make two appeals this morning, this afternoon. If there are things in your life that you believe you need to change before it's too late, please come forward and we'll pray for you. If you have not yet given your life to Jesus and would like to do so and be baptized in the next baptism before it is too late, please come forward and we'll pray for you. If you want Bible studies, we can help you with that as well. Those who are watching online, if you want someone to reach out to you, go to our website and fill out that contact form and one of the elders or pastor will get in touch with you. None of us can hide from God. He created us so he knows. He knows us. He knows our needs. He knows our darkest secrets. But you can trust him. He died for you and me because... He loved us. He only wants the best for you and me. So say yes to him. Don't delay in giving your life to him. Say it like you know it. I'll say yes. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. And if there's anyone that would like to come forward at this time, having heard the message today, please step out of your seat and come forward. principle behind your word and that is simple we must follow your word no amendments no adjustments no nuances no halfway in no halfway out we have to be completely sold out we thank you Lord for using Elder Joan to remind us as we continue on this iceberg series that sometimes 
we can be in church and not follow the word of God. And so, Lord, help us. Because the truth is that sometimes we have some experiences in our lives that we would not have to experience if we would have just listened the first time. And how does it happen? Sometimes we take a seat in the wrong place. And by sitting there, there is a destruction that sometimes hits us or by extension, those that follow us because we are Christians. So help us to remember we're not living our lives in a vacuum. And yes, it is true that it, uh, our relationship is between us and Jesus Christ. But it is also true that we can be stumbling blocks for those who don't know the way themselves. Help us to do our part. Help us to trust you and help us to be able to discern your voice in your word so that we don't have to wait for the pastor or for the elders to speak because we have learned how to hear your voice for ourselves. So as we go back into the world, not because we are of the world, but because we are the voices of you in every highway and, and byway. Use us this week to make a difference in somebody's life who doesn't know that there's a God who loves them, that created them, that died for them, that rose again for them, that is coming back one of these days to take us home. But we need the word. And the word is not just sentences. The word is the person of Jesus Christ. Help us to stay focused there, I pray. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say amen. While you're standing or sitting, please sit down for a quick minute. I have to say this. I have good news for us, whether you're in the building or at home. After a long time, we have waited and agonized and waited and we have waited and we have waited. And guess what? We are ready to open up our wellness center. Let the church say amen. I thought more of you would have been happy, especially those of us that squeezed into our clothes today. Let the church say amen. I thought you would have said we would have said amen. I almost, you know, but we would have said amen. So here's the thing. We are still going to have to work out the logistics of how we will open up the space. But we are now in a position where as a church, first of all, we are going to start using the space to see how we can use the space in an appropriate way. Are you with me so far? So what I'm saying then is, is that we are going to be working with our property management department to set up times and days to which our wellness center will be opened. Are you with me so far? So let me help you out. Don't show up to church with your gym bag and say, I was in the area. And so you can't just open the door, Pastor, because me know I have key. I know that you have a key. It doesn't work that simple. We have to schedule it because we also need to make sure that we are safe. Let me give you an example. I know that you've heard before that people have just gone on the treadmill and walked for a few minutes and all of a sudden they didn't feel so well. Well, if you try to come to the gym by yourself and there's nobody else there, what if something happens to you while you're there alone? So like everything else that we are trying to do in our space, everything has to be done in order. So what we will do to make sure that we get this communicated is, to those of you that are on our church update group, we will put some information there because we need to know 
who would like to come and what time you would like to come so that we can adjust the hours to which it is open. So when we say a soft opening, that doesn't mean from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. That's not soft, that's hard. <laughs> soft opening is we will open it a couple of hours per day and we will build on that because we have to have individuals that are here that can help us to manage the space. Does that make sense to everybody? What I like about this is that we said we were going to do it and we're now at a place where we can implement it. Health is important to our church. Why? Ask anybody that's not healthy. Is it easy to do the Lord's work when you are not well? Is it easier to have a clear mind when you are not well? So therefore, exercise and wellness helps God to be able to use us because we have the energy and the strength and the mind to do the work. There's no indictment here, right? Remember, your pastor is still working on getting into better shape, not just because I want my suits to button all the way around me. <laughs> and I'm committed to not putting the button over this thing until it buttons without the bulge. Let the church say amen. I ain't doing that. But here's what I will say. As I continue to exercise, my mind is becoming clearer. And because my mind is becoming clearer, I'm watching the Lord trying to use me to do other things. But it's not just Pastor Andre. It's all of us. And because there are a lot of older individuals that are in our congregation, I also want to say this. Your age doesn't exempt you from doing the Lord's work. So there are some things we have no control over. Some of the older chronic diseases, we have nothing to do with that. We can't. It's part of aging. But if we start working out now, we will still be active even if we're 100. Talk to me, somebody. You have, some of you still have grandparents that are 100 in other places where they're still gardening, still cooking, still washing, you know, when you just bend down your ch 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 all right, fine, that's a different conversation. Oh my goodness, why did he go there? But the reason why they're able to do that is because they've been active. They didn't wait for the illness to come. They're active because it's a lifestyle. And what better a message to send to the world before we talk to them and before they hear our voices, they will know that our bodies are the temple by how the temple looks. So we're not going to size one because there are some slim people that are unhealthy. They're just slim. So it's not large and it's not small. It's lifestyle healthy. So we're going to do our best to have a holistic ministry at our church. And we're going to try and do our best to make sure that everyone that would like to has an opportunity to work out at the church because we have, have you even gone down the hallway to see it yet? How many of you have gone in there? All right, now I can see all the hands of the nosies. Okay, good. <laughs> After church is finished, for those of you that may not be staying back for um, prayer and fasting, go and, take, go and take a look so you can see what we have and then you can see whether or not it's something that will work for you, but I promise you, we have everything that we need there. And let's just say there's a whole bunch of us that want to work out at the same time. This is one of the reasons why we fixed our fellowship hall area so that we have a larger space. We can even turn on the screen and work out together in a larger space. Are you with me so far? When Israel moved, they didn't move as individuals. They moved as a congregation, not just for worship, but their exercise and wellness. Wouldn't it be nice to say that as a congregation, we are healthy? Emotionally, spiritually, 
and physically. So let's try. No body shaming. But the truth is, when we are larger in size, sometimes we're not healthy. And the truth is, sometimes when we're really, really small, we're not healthy because we're skipping meals because we don't want to put on weight. Let the church say amen. Healthy is a lifestyle. And we're promoting that. So, with that being said, it's time for our mission and vision. Come on, stand to your feet with me, please. And while you're standing, stretch across the row and take the person's hand to the left and the right of you, please. Don't be afraid to take somebody's hand. You might receive the blessing of getting some of their hand cream on your hand. Let the church say amen. <laughs> As a church, we are moving from what? Pieces to peace. As we are connecting people to our God, our, our, and. And you know, recently in another meeting, we said something. And I'm going to have to get it added to the back there. And it wasn't even from me. I wish I was smart enough to say this. But our worship to God helps us to support people. Right? Our worship to God helps us to support people in whatever condition we find them in and ourselves. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. And make his face to shine on and towards you and give you a peace that passes all understanding. And may we never forget that because we are a congregation, whether in person or online, you are calling us to support one another. Not always with finances, not always with prayer, not always with something tangible, but knowing that we love one another, that's enough to keep us going. So bless each person that's here, and by extension, the family members that we are connected to. And may we as a church continue to grow in faith because of what Jesus has done for us. Because we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Let everyone say amen. And before you leave... Um, our deacons are going to usher you out. Have a wonderful week. And the weather is good. Go for a walk. Drink some water. Put some Himalayan salt in your water so it ab absorbs into the tissues of your body. God bless you all and have a wonderful day. And for those of you that are staying behind, once everyone has been escorted out, we will begin promptly our uh, fasting and praying service together.